At this time, you should be receiving a handout. Now, this is the first handout I've ever given on a Sunday morning sermon. And, uh, and it's color-coded. Amen, guys? I thought I'd fire you guys on up. And it's a breakdown of the tribal divisions of the promised land. So you need to keep that handy as well as with your Bible today. We're going to be covering all the way from chapters 13 to 22 today. And overviewing because we're going to be talking about, and the title of the sermon is, The Allotment of the Promised Land. We have three points. Number one, faith and grace eliminate failure. Number two, a fail-safe place. And number three, a failure to communicate. Let's get our Bibles open. And Joshua, chapter 13. There's been a great campaign that's taken out 31 kings. And then we read in verse 1 of chapter 13. When Joshua was old and well advanced in years, the Lord said to him, You are very old, and there's still very large areas of land to be taken over. Middle of verse 6. Be sure to allocate this land to Israel for an inheritance, as I have instructed you, and divide it as an inheritance amongst the nine tribes and the half-tribe of Manasseh. The other half of Manasseh, the Reubenites and the Gadites, had received the inheritance that Moses had given them east of the Jordan, as he, the servant Lord, had assigned it to them. Okay, take out your little map right here. Tribal divisions. You see the Dead Sea at the bottom, and you see the Sea of Galilee at the top. Between them runs the Jordan River. So as you're looking at this, on your right side is what's called the Transjordan tribes, the Across Jordan tribes. And what happened right here, as Moses brought the Israelites through the desert a second time to go into the promised land because their lack of faith did not allow them to go in the first time, we find right here that they took out all of the kings in these areas. And so the tribe of Gad and the tribe of Reuben came to Moses, and he came to Moses in Numbers chapter 32, and they said, hey, we want this to be our promised land territory and Moses said well that would be great but here's the deal you can leave your women and children and a few men behind to guard them but the bulk of your army has to go with us into the promised land after we've conquered all the promised land then you can go back to your inheritance on the east side of the Jordan and then he added to them the half tribe of Manasseh and so these are called the Transjordan tribes so all of these tribes received Their inheritance because of Moses. Notice also right here, you see down right above the Dead Sea is Gilgal. That's approximately the point where they came across the Jordan. And at Gilgal was where they were circumcised and rededicated themselves to the Lord. And then, of course, they got ready for the great battle of Jericho. Amen, guys? Chapter 14. Verse 1. Now these are the areas the Israelites received as an inheritance land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest, Joshua son of Nun, and the heads of the tribal clans of Israel allotted to them. Their inheritances were assigned by lot to the nine and a half tribes as the Lord commanded through Moses. Moses had granted the two and a half tribes their inheritance east of the Jordan, but had not granted the Levites an inheritance amongst the rest, for the sons of Joseph had become two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. The Levites received no share of the land, but only towns to live in, with pasture lands for their flocks and herds. So the Israelites divide the land just as the Lord commanded Moses. Now, the men of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal. Gilgal, at this particular point in the campaign, was the center of worship and all activity for the people of God. And it's at this point the tribes come together, and we find the first stage of the division of the land. As we said before, at this particular point, he says, hey, two and a half tribes have already got their inheritance on the east side of the Jordan. So there are nine and a half left because the Levites don't get an inheritance. Their inheritance is the Lord. Amen, guys? Now, you say, well, that adds up to 12 tribes. And if you take the tribe of Levi out, how can there be 12? Because Jacob's son, Joseph, has two sons, and he receives the blessing of the firstborn, even though he's not the firstborn son, but his sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, each become separate tribes. So in a way of speaking, there are 13 tribes, but of course the Levites are the priestly tribe. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Amen? Amen. Now, a few things to know. 
In Numbers chapter 1, about the second year after the Exodus, came the first census. In the first census, the largest tribe was Judah. It had prominence. The second largest tribe, when you combine Manasseh and Ephraim together, was called the tribe of Joseph. So it had promised. By the end of the whole time in the desert, the time of wandering, a second census was taken in Numbers chapter 26. And Joseph became the largest tribe, and then Judah was the second largest. But above all things, you need to understand, and we'll explain it in a few moments right here, why Judah was the preeminent tribe. So, in chapters 15, 16, and 17, we find the division of the land for Judah, for Ephraim, and Manasseh. Okay? Now, these are the most powerful tribes. This stage of the division is a very simple one. Joshua, being the awesome general that he was, he says, hey, we've got some powerful tribes guarding our east side. We've got to be very careful for the south. We're going to put our most powerful tribe down there. That's Judah. Does everybody see where Judah is in the south right here? And from a perspective of Gilgal, he says, I'm going to put Manasseh and Ephraim bordering the north. So we're putting our second most powerful tribe right there. So the first stage of the dividing of the land was a military decision made by Joshua to secure the land. Now, we need to digress just a little bit. The question comes, well, why was Judah preeminent? And and why was all this division going on? Actually, it goes all the way back to the blessing that Jacob gave his 12 sons. Let's go all the way back to Genesis chapter 49. You're going to love this. It's so awesome how the Bible just ties totally all together. You know what I mean? Amen. You're well aware of the fact that Jacob had two wives and they had two maidservants. And Jacob had children with each of these. A total of 12 sons. At the end of his life, he gave a blessing to each one of the sons. Now, when we read this, you're going to go, that's a blessing? Well, amen. He was a little out of sorts with a couple of boys. We're going to read on down, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 49. This is the end of Jacob's life. Then Jacob called for his sons and says, Gather around so I can tell you what will happen to you in the days to come. Assemble. Listen, sons of Jacob. Listen to your father Israel. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might. The first sign of my strength, excelling in honor, excelling in power. Turbulent as the waters, you will no longer excel. For you went up onto your father's bed and onto my couch and defiled it. Well, if you read in your Bible, you'll find in Genesis chapter 35, verse 22, Reuben dishonored his father by sleeping with his concubine. And he says, because you sinned against me, I am taking away from you the right of the firstborn. That was his blessing. (laughs) Verse five. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are weapons of violence. Let me not enter their council. Let me not join their assembly. For they have killed men in their anger and hamstrung oxen as they pleased. Cursed be their anger so fierce and their fury so cruel. I will scatter them in Jacob and disperse them in Israel. Well, I think many of you remember Genesis chapter 34, where Simeon and Levi, in retaliation to the Shechemites, totally annihilated them and massacred them. Now, in fact, one of the Shechemites had raped their sister. But in response, it was way over the top. And Jacob says to the boys right after it happened, you have become a stench to me and my name. And so his blessing, which becomes prophetic, he says, I will scatter them in Jacob and disperse them in Israel. So they now lose what would have been the blessing of the firstborn, So we find right here, Reuben's out, Simeon's out, Levi's out. So who's next guy up? Judah. Verse 8. Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son will bow down to you. You're a lion's cub of Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness, who dares to rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. Until he comes to whom it belongs and the obedience of the nations is his. 
His blessing is that all the rulers will come from his line. And it becomes a blessing, a prophecy. From Judah comes David, Solomon, Josiah, and the King of Kings himself, Jesus Christ. Amen? So Judah had preeminence. It was given the blessing by Jacob himself to be the one to rule. Amen. Well, now, let's uh, move on back to uh, our text here in Joshua. And we find now a second stage to the division. Remember, the tribes on the east side, the Transjordan tribes, have been given their land by Moses. It was a done deal. We find the most powerful tribes, Judah and Joseph, are stationed in the south and the north to guard the center, Gilgal, right there. And so now the other seven tribes have to be taken care of. So we read this in verse 1. The whole assembly of the Israelites gathered at Shiloh and set up the tent of meeting there. Now, if you look on your sheet, we find that the center point of the rule of Israel gets shifted from Gilgal to Shiloh. Notice that Shiloh is in what we will call Ephraim. Of course, that shouldn't surprise us because what tribe is Joshua from? Ephraim, right? And so the command of God in Deuteronomy chapter 12 was that they were to pray and a lot was to be cast for where the center of worship would be. And so though silent in the book of Joshua, we know because of the commands of Moses in the Pentateuch, that was in fact done. And so the lot fell on Shiloh and at Shiloh was erected the tabernacle of God, where the ark of God was at, where the presence of God was at, where the altar of God was at. And it was the only place you were allowed to go. And altar sacrifices on the altar of the Lord. At Shiloh and at Shiloh only. So we read now that all the Israelites gather there. And we continue in verse 1. The country was brought under their control. But there were still seven Israelite tribes who had not yet received their inheritance. So Joshua said to the Israelites, how long will you wait before you begin to take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you? Kind of an interesting word right here. Some translations translate it literally from the Hebrew, and it would say, how long will you be slack? How long are you guys going to be slackers? (laughs) Sluggers. Not doing anything. Hey, let's get up and let's get going is what he's saying right here. He says, verse 4, appoint three men from each tribe. I will send them out to make a survey of the land to write a description of it, according to the inheritance of each. Then they will turn to me. You will divide the land into seven parts. Judas remain in its territory on the south, and the house of Joseph in its territory on the north. After you've written descriptions of the seven parts of the land, bring them here to me, and I will cast lots for you in the presence of the Lord God. The Levites, however, do not get a portion among you, because the priestly service of the Lord is their inheritance. And Gad, Reuben, and the half-tribe of Manasseh have all received their inheritance on the east side of the Jordan. Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave it to them. So what he does right here, he says, okay, the two and a half tribes on the east, they've got their land. Joseph and Judah have their land. Now we have seven tribes to be able to give the possession to. Now, the second stage of the division begins here at Shiloh. He says, I want three men from each of your tribes to come to me. And so they select three guys that are going to be surveyors. So it's a group of 21 guys. These 21 guys are to go out in all of the land that was subdued. Now, granted, it wasn't totally conquered, but Israel had control of the land. And he says, I want you to go out and I want you to survey so that you find seven Plots or allotments of land in all the areas that we have subdued. So they all go out and they survey it. Now, when they come on back, nobody knows who's going to get which piece of land. And so a lot was thrown. And the Bible says that the first lot came up and it was Benjamin. And so you can see what Benjamin got right here. And it got a pretty choice piece of land. That was where Gilgal was at. That was where Jericho and Ai We're at at also bordered on Jerusalem right there. So we see right here that each one of the tribes then get a lot. The next lot falls to Simeon, the next one to Issachar, then Asher, Naphtali, and then finally to Dan. Now, let's look at the lot that falls right here to Simeon. Look what it says. 
Verse 1, chapter 19. The second lot came out for the tribe of Simeon, clan by clan. Drop down to verse 9. The inheritance of the Simeonites was taken from the share of Judah because Judah's portion was more than they needed. So the Simeonites received their inheritance within the territory of Judah. Now, you remember what was said in Jacob's word about Simeon and Levi. I will scatter them in Jacob and disperse them in Israel. In effect, Simeon didn't get any land. It's just got a spot inside of Judah, inside of, so to speak, Israel, Jacob. And so they were scattered inside another tribe. The Levites, likewise, they didn't get any land. In chapter 21, we find that they're put into 48 cities. And so we see that scattering is one of the disciplines of God. Now, here's the grace of God. Can you think of a better nation to be scattered in than Judah? (laughs) The most powerful army amongst the Israelites? That's a blessing you get placed right there. Amen, guys? And the Levites, they become the priests. They become the people that are the mediators between God and his people. Now, that's a cranking role. You see, with the Lord, we need to understand and have a deep conviction. Failure is not final. God will even use our disciplines, our hard times, according to Hebrews 12, in order to show us grace. Is that cranking? Now, you know, another thing that you'll notice as you read through the text right here is the fact that in time, the Israelites were not able to subdue all of the land. Even Judah was not able to do it. In chapter 15, in verse 63, we read, Judah could not dislodge the Jebusites who were living in Jerusalem. To this day, the Jebusites live there with the people of Judah. So you see, Jerusalem is right on the border of Judah and Benjamin. And it says the Jebusites couldn't be dislodged. And they couldn't be dislodged until, of course, David comes along. And then he takes care of them. Amen, Gus? Read on in chapter 16. We read about Ephraim in verse 10. They did not dislodge the Canaanites living in Gezer. To this day, Canaanites live amongst the people of Ephraim, but are required to do forced labor. They failed. Wow. Go on to chapter 19, verse 47. But the Danites had difficulty taking possession of their Torah, so they went up and attacked Leshem, took it, put it to the sword, and occupied it. They settled in Leshem and named it Dan after their forefather. Well, we see right here a great principle. We see that the promised land was taken because of faith. Remember the first time they tried to go to the promised land and the people got scared and so they lacked faith. They didn't trust and obey God. Now, even in the midst of taking this promised land, there are some areas that they're lacking faith to overcome. Now, let's look at a very special interaction that Joshua has with the people of Joseph. Go back to Joshua chapter 17, verse 12. Yet the Manassites were not able to occupy their towns, for the Canaanites were determined to live in that region. However, when the Israelites grew stronger, they subjected the Canaanites to forced labor to drive them out completely. The people of Joseph said to Joshua, Why have you given us only one allotment and one portion for an inheritance? We are a numerous people, and the Lord has blessed us abundantly. Remember the census? They were the largest group by this time. And Joshua gets a little sarcastic. (laughs) If you're so numerous, Joshua answered, and if the hill country of Ephraim is too small for you, go up into the forest and clear land for yourselves there in the land of Perizzites and Arephites. The people of Joseph replied, the hill country is not enough for us. And all the Canaanites who live in the plain have iron chariots, both them and Bethshan and its settlements of those in the valley of Jezreel. But Joshua said to the house of Joseph to Ephraim and Massa, you are numerous and very powerful. You will not only have one allotment, but the forested hill country as well. Clear it and its farthest limits will be yours. Though the Canaanites have iron chariots and though they are strong, you can drive them out. He says, "Okay, so you don't have enough room. Go get the hill country. Go get the forested area. We will give you the grace of even more room. They said, well, it's, you know, there are a whole bunch of iron chariots and there are this and that. He says, listen, if you have faith in God, God will eliminate these obstacles. Very interesting. At the end of all the allotment, Joshua gets his allotment. Read this in chapter 19. Verse 49. 
When they had finished dividing the land into its allotted portions, the Israelites gave Joshua, son of Nun, an inheritance amongst them, as the Lord had commanded. They gave him the town he asked for, Timna Sarah, in the hill country of Ephraim. And he built up the town and settled there. This was a man that was true to his word, like a true leader. He told the people to have faith, and he had faith, and he took his allotment. Are you with me right here? Now, there's some great lessons that we need to understand. Our point right here is, of course, faith and grace eliminate failure. To some degree, the Israelites failed to conquer the entire promised land. Now, last week, we made the analogy that the promised land, for them, is like us evangelizing the whole world. But another very biblical analogy is that the promised land is like us becoming Christians. We're, so to speak, baptized through the Jordan River. And then we're trying to take out all the enemy, all the sin out of our life. You know what I'm talking about? And I don't know of any Christian that doesn't have a few pockets of Canaanite and Perizzites around. You see, in a very real way, all of us fail. All of us fail. We need to understand that failure can only be overcome by faith. And what is faith? To trust and obey the word of God. You know, as people, some of us here in the audience have failed at our jobs. We've lost job after job after job. We failed to build a career path. We failed at romance. Girlfriend after girlfriend. Some have even said, I'm going to even look for a girlfriend or a boyfriend outside of God's kingdom. They're so discouraged. You know, when you, when you fail, you get discouraged. You get down. You get depressed. You lack faith. You don't obey. Some of us even failed at our marriages and gotten divorced. Some of us have failed at our finances. Others have failed in our Christian life in the area of purity. Others have failed in leadership. Some have even failed in the ministry. And some have failed so much that they've fallen away. But what's the teaching from the scriptures here? The teaching's clear. With the discipline of God on Simeon and Levi came the grace to bring them back. Even in discipline, God has grace. He wants to bless you. He wants to make your life awesome. But you've got to return to faith just like the Levites and the Simeonites did. Amen? Secondly, in a very real way, we're, we're all in a battle to drive out these Canaanites and parasites. And there's not one of us that doesn't fail, so to speak, in our Christian life. There's not one. You know, the two brothers that stood up here, I hope you deeply respected. It wasn't just a matter of standing up in front of the congregation and saying, Here, here's my life. I tanked it. Do you know how much Bible study and prayer and guts it just took to get here? I mean, I respect these two men immensely. I mean, Martin, what a, what a great guy. But, you know, he was married in the kingdom and got divorced. In the midst of all that, the Lord's blessed him with an awesome, beautiful wife who's studying the Bible now. Wow, that's grace. And then Albert, I, I know the Lord's going to bless this man right here. <laughs> but you know, Albert was an intern with the church. He was the one that oversaw the Upside Down Club. This was one cranking dude. And yet over time, he couldn't drive out the Canaanites. He let the Canaanites remain in the land. That discouraged his faith. Then he began to compromise like the Danites, and he allowed them to live there. And then over time, they took over the entire promised land, and he fell away. You know, the awesome thing the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12, is that God remembers not our sin. When we come to God, his grace eliminates every failure that we've ever had. Is that exciting? 
And you know, when, when you really accept it, and one of the real challenges of Albert was that I said, bro, you've got to accept God's grace. You know, for a lot of us, we're just too prideful to accept the grace of God. We, we, we just want to just kind of bootstrap ourselves up spiritually. And sometimes you got to say, listen, I am a derelict, I'm weak, and I need God, and I need His grace, and that's the only thing that's going to make up for my failures. Are you with me right here, church? And then once we accepted that grace, we're cleansed, we're whole, and now it's time to have a faith where we trust and obey the Lord and completely take the promised land. Are you with me here, church? Let's move on to our second point. A fail, safe place. Let's go to Joshua chapter 20. We're going to talk about the cities of refuge. Then the Lord said to Joshua, tell the Israelites to designate the cities of refuge. As I instructed you through Moses, so that anyone who kills a person accidentally or unintentionally may flee there and find protection from the avenger of blood. When he flees to one of these cities, he is to stand in the entrance of the city gate and state a case before the elders of that city. Then they are to meet him into the city and to give him a place to live with them. If the avenger of blood pursues him, they must not surrender the one accused because he killed his neighbor unintentionally and without malice or afterthought. He is to stay in the city until he has stood trial before the assembly and until the death of the high priest who is serving at that time. Then he may go back to his own home town from which he fled. You know, very interestingly, in Deuteronomy chapter 19, verses 1 through 3, Moses, through the Holy Spirit, commanded the Israelites, he says, you need to have three cities of refuge spread out. One in the north, one in the central area of the promised land, and one in the south. Well, Joshua goes, wow, we have a little bit of a challenge right here because not only do we have the regular part of the promised land, but we've also got the Transjordan tribes. And so he says, okay, we're not going to have three cities of refuge. We're going to have six. One in the north, one in the central, and one in the south of the western side, and one in the north, central, and south on the eastern side. And what were these cities of refuge about? Well, it was for people who, quote, unintentionally Failed. They killed another guy. The example in Deuteronomy was, hey, if you're out with a fellow Jew and you're working on something and your axe head falls off and then it goes into your friend and it kills him. By the law, even though it was accidental, you needed to be killed. But God in his grace says, hold it. That's not true justice. And so God provided the cities of refuge. Now, there are some things that we need to understand right here. Number one, you could translate the word avenger to be redeemer. Because for the Jew, if someone killed someone in his family, he was responsible. It was his duty to go after and kill that guy. He was the redeemer of the family. So what do we, what do we learn? Well, there's some kind of interesting things. The book of Deuteronomy talks about how With every city of refuge, you've got to make sure there are roads going to these cities of refuge. And let's face it, you know, perhaps the best analogy of the city of refuge is God's church. Are you with me right here? Of course, the the biggest difference is he's talking about people who unintentionally sin. And, of course, we're all intentional sinners. Amen, guys? (laughs) On the other hand, it's, it's very interesting on outside sources. It's in these outside sources that are well documented... It says that on these roads, at every crossroads in Israel, there would be a sign that would point to the city of refuge that would say, refuge, refuge. And so people would know where to flee. Secondly, unique to all the other cities in Israel, the doors of the city of refuge, the gates, would never be locked. They were always open. Day and night. And you got to remember, that is the church. We are to be a refuge for people. We are to be a safe place. You know, I, I appreciated Marty Wooten's article. I hope that you'll have a chance to read it this afternoon or this evening. But in the article, and when, when Marty first came, he was very open. He says, I was very skeptical about coming to the, the City of Angel Church. But one of the things that I just got blown away with was when I started talking to some of the teenagers and they were just so open and candid with me about their struggles and challenges. And then as I as I felt the fellowship, I felt something that I hadn't seen. 
It was a fellowship that was out without judgmental attacks and labeling. You know, that's, that's very important for anybody that's a parent that has teenagers. Because all of us as parents know our teenagers are going to go astray. How do we know that? Well, they're genetically related to us. <laughs> and, and Marty goes, man, this is so different. What we've experienced in other places, this is awesome. The church here is a safe place. He goes on. He talks about how that we're not tolerating sin. You've got to be hard line about sin. But you can be hard line without being harsh. See, we've got to be loving and concerning and helping the weak. Are you with me right here? You say, well, how, how, how precious is that? Well, I think that's best demonstrated in Ken Zindler. You know, I talked about Ken. He was a preacher in Boston, a preacher in Orlando. And then he got fired for preaching the word too hard in Orlando. So then he looked for another place in Florida to go and worship. And he worshiped there. He became a teacher and a football coach. But it really wasn't quite what he was looking for, particularly for his children. And then he started listening to the messages online. Then he started reading the articles online. He goes, man, I think this is, this is what I want. This is, this is what not only I need, but my wife needs and my kids need. This safe place, this place where they love the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. They don't tolerate sin. But bottom line, they just got open arms, just like the father had in the parable of the prodigal son. Well, very interesting. You know, Satan, right as you're about to make a momentous, big, awesome decision, he comes right there. That little Canaanite comes on in there. You know what I'm talking about? And right before he comes on out here, just a few days ago, his father good-heartedly calls him from Texas. And he says, Ken, I've been thinking. Son, I think what I'd like to do is to hand over the family business. Now, you have to move down to Texas. But here's the thing, son. You can make a hundred thousand to two hundred thousand a year easy. Ken goes, Dad, I told you I'm going to California to be with the City of Angels Church. Thank you, but that is my priority. How precious, how precious do you count the kingdom of God? How precious do you count a group of people who've got your back? How precious do you count a group of people that are going to help you up when you're lame and you're limping? Now let's face it. The true avenger is death. And we've got to seek out the city of refuge. All the signs, the word of God point there. But if you don't flee to the city of refuge, the avenger will eventually get you. And you've got to come. You've got to be a part of what biblically is God's church. A place where people are individually surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Have decided to give their lives over to God as disciples. And then have been baptized for the remission of sins to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Those are the people of God. And you can tell the people of God because the Spirit is in the people of God. You know, very interesting, the Bible says in a lukewarm church, in Revelation chapter 3, the Bible says that Jesus is standing on the outside knocking, wanting to come on in. Wow. Jesus has left the building in a lukewarm church. Yeah. Wow. Talk about it, you come into a church that's sold out. You come into a church with disciples. I'm not talking about that all of us are just awesome cranking disciples. We got some Canaanites on our shoulders and our knees and some are on our butts right there. I don't know. But bottom line, you've come to a group of people that's a safe place. Are you with me right here? And church, you've, you've, you not only need to seek it in a collective sense, but you need to be building about three or four or five relationships where you really count it as a safe place where you can open up and confess your sins. You're commanded to do that. Where you can open up and just tell them your worst worries and all your fears and your anxieties. And you know something? Confession, when you get it on out there with a brother or sister that's going to keep it confidential. I mean, and then you pray about it, you know, wow, it is great to be in the church of the living God. Are you with me right here? 
You see, the church is a fail safe place. And as a church, we need to keep our arms open to all those people that are fleeing on the road looking for a city of refuge. Our last point is a failure to communicate. You say, is this about marriage? Well, it sort of is. It sort of is. A failure to communicate. Let's go to chapter 22 of Joshua. What we see right here in the first few verses of chapter 22 is what you call in war terms a farewell to arms. Verse 1. Then Joshua summoned the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe Manasseh and said to them, You've done all that Moses, the servant Lord, commanded, and you've obeyed me in everything I've commanded. For a long time now, this very day, you've not deserted your brothers, but have carried out the mission the Lord your God gave you. Is that awesome? Amen. Now that the Lord your God has given your brothers rest as he promised, return to your homes and land that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of the Jordan. But be very careful to keep the commandment and the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you to love the Lord your God, to walk in all of his way, to obey his commands, to hold fast to him and to serve him with all your heart and soul. Then Joshua blessed them and sent them away and they went to their homes. Can you imagine this? Now, most commentators believe that not only were the two and a half tribes, the Transjordan tribes there, but the, all of the tribes of Israel were gathered. Can you imagine a group of guys that for seven years wow. had fought battle after battle? Yes, had endured some losses, but for the most part had done what no other people had ever done in a way no other people had ever done it. Wow. Here they were, and I'm sure you get into battle enough, you saved somebody's life, and they've saved yours. You talk about a foxhole mentality where it's one for all and all for one. That's what these Israelites had become. And now Joshua sums them and says, guys, we've essentially subdued the promised land. It's time for you Transjordan tribes to go back home. To go see your wives, your children. It's been seven long years. Can you imagine the hugs? And the tears. I mean, being comrades up, I mean, it's so cool just to hear Albert sharing about Carlos. And here they are crying up there in the Hollywood Hills. Amen, guys. <laughs> <laughs> because there's a bond there. They're fighting for each other. They're fighting for the Lord. And when you've been fighting side by side, I mean, there is a bond. Are you with me there? Yeah. And so you see all these soldiers hugging and crying. And then she's going. Joshua said, hey, you guys, you, got, you guys got to go on home. And so the Transjordan tribes go. Well, we read on. Verse 9. So the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh left the Israelites at Shiloh and Canaan to return to Gilead, their own land, which had acquired, been acquired in accordance with the command of the Lord through Moses. So they had gone back across the Jordan, and they're back on the east side on Gilead. Amen. When they came to Gileath, near the Jordan in the land of Canaan, the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half-tribe of Manasseh built an imposing altar there by the Jordan. And when the Israelites heard that they built the altar on the border of Canaan at Gileath, near the Jordan on the Israelite side, the whole assembly of Israel gathered at Shiloh to go to war against them. Hey, where, where is this farewell to arms feeling that we had? What happened? Well, the Bible just simply states, at least at this point, that on their way back to Gilead, the Transjordan's tribes had stopped right before the Jordan and they had erected another altar to God. And when all the Israelite tribes heard it, they gathered together and they said, Oh my gosh, this is apostasy. We have got to go and deal with these people. Because if they have departed from the Lord and erected another altar, because remember, you can only worship on the altar of the Lord, now located there at Shiloh, if they've done it, we're going to have to go kill them because of the honor of God. Now, that's a great point to be made right here. It's that you have got to do right by God before you worry about your relationships. You know, we talk to non-Christians all the time. We go, hey, don't worry about who is right. Just get in the Bible and decide what is right. And then you can decide who is right. And right here, 
in a very real way, we find the Western tribes are saying, wow, we have got to do something. Well, let's let's read on right here. Verse 15. So the Israelites sent Phineas, son of Eleazar. Now remember who Phineas is? Numbers chapter 25. He's the one that shish those two people that were going against the Lord. Amen. Okay. So the Israelites sent Phineas, son of Eleazar, the priest, to the land of Gilead, to Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. So what do you do? So they sent Phineas, and we're going to find with ten tribal leaders, they go to the Transjordan tribes. They cross the Jordan, and they go to Gilead to meet with them before they go to war. Verse 15. When they went to Gilead, to Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, they said to them, The whole assembly of the Lord says... How could you break faith with the Lord, the God of Israel, like this? How could you turn away from the Lord and build for yourselves an altar in rebellion against them now? Was it not the sin of Peor enough for us? Up to this very day, we have not cleansed ourselves from that sin, even though a plague fell on the community of the Lord. And are you now turning away from the Lord? That's the Numbers 25 account. Read on. If you rebel against the Lord today, tomorrow he'll be angry with the whole community of Israel. If the land you possess is defiled... Come over to the Lord's land where the Lord's tabernacle stands and share the land with us. But do not rebel against the Lord or against us by building an altar for yourselves other than the altar of the Lord our God. When Achan, son of Zerah, acted unfaithfully regarding the devoted things, did not the wrath come upon the whole community of Israel? He was not the only one who died for his sin. Now, this is very interesting. They are concerned. They're upset. In their minds, the Transjordan tribes have done something according to God's word that is worthy of death. And yet Phineas and the guys go and talk to these guys there in Gilead. They said, hey guys, what the heck are you doing? And then you see the kind of hearts that they had. It says, guys, if it's just a matter of, 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 of the land and departing from the Lord, hey, come back and live with us. Now remember, everybody was, was pretty... You know, kind of hung on right here to their promised land, their allotment. But for them to say, listen, you come and live in our land. We love you so much. We care about you. You just come back across and be with us so you will worship the one true God at his altar there at Shiloh. Let's read on. Verse 21. Then Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh replied to the heads of the clans of Israel. The mighty one, God the Lord. The mighty one, God the Lord. He knows. And let Israel know. If this has been rebellion or disobedience to the Lord, do not spare us this day. If we have built our own altar and turned away from the Lord and offer burnt sacrifices or grain offerings or to sacrifice fellowship offerings on it, may the Lord himself call us to account. No, we did it for fear that someday your descendants might say to ours, what do you have to do with the Lord, the God of Israel? The Lord made the Jordan a boundary between you and us, you Reubenites and Gadites. You have no share in the Lord. So your descendants might cause ours to stop fearing the Lord. That is why we said, let us get ready and build an altar, but not for burnt offerings or sacrifices. On the contrary, it is to be a witness between us and you and for the generations that follow that we will worship the Lord at his sanctuary with burnt offerings, sacrifices, fellowship offerings. Then in the future, your descendants will not be able to say to ours, you have no share in the Lord. And we said, if they ever say this to us or to our descendants, we will answer, look, look at the replica of the Lord's altar, which our fathers built. Not for burnt offerings and sacrifices, but as a witness between us and you. So we see right here that the Western tribes come and they confront the Eastern tribes with apostasy. And the Eastern tribes are totally taken aback. And they start saying, the mighty one of God, the the Lord, the mighty one, the God of the Lord. And they start giving their explanation. It kind of reminds me of uh, my two sons, Sean and Eric, when they were a little bit young. And uh, we're kind of a tennis family, and the boys were out practicing one day, and I was kind of monitoring things. And all of a sudden, you know, Sean hits the ball on over, and Eric hits it back, and, and Sean goes, out. Eric goes, what are, what are you talking about? That was not out. Sean goes, before the Lord, before the mighty one of the Lord, before the Lord, it was out. Eric goes, let's just leave the Lord out of this. <laughs> You know, whenever you want to, whenever you want to show that you're totally honest, you go before the Lord. The Lord knows my heart. Have you ever said that to your wife? <laughs> the Lord knows I didn't need to do it. <laughs> See what had happened, and they, and they get open right here. Say, man, we were in such fear, such anxiety, wow. that before we crossed the Jordan, we say, hey, you know, 
let's make a replica of the altar of God right here. And it'll be awesome because, well, it'll be just like the one in Shiloh. And so if someday they kind of forget that we too are part of the people of God, they can remember that we built a replica as a memorial, as a witness of the fact that we are brothers. Isn't that interesting? It says we never intended to offer sacrifices or burnt offering or anything. This was simply to show that we are brothers in God. Of course, the West tribes rejoice and they're fired up and everybody goes back to their home. (laughs) Well, what do we learn from this? Well, I think we learn several things. Number one, we learn that the Beatles are not right. All you need is love. (laughs) Now, that, that wasn't that would not have produced harmony within the people of God. You see, in a very real way, Phineas was commended as an outstanding man who was zealous for the honor of God. Now, I think it's very interesting to me in this particular case how indeed he follows through with this reputation. He does not lead the Western tribes to war. He goes and initiates. He goes to them in their territory, in their home. And he confronts them very specifically about their hypocrisy and their apostasy. Now, as it turns out, neither was true. Why? Because there's a failure to communicate. But harmony came when the zeal of God for his honor was combined with compassion. Isn't that what Jesus was trying to do in Matthew chapter 18? When he says, if someone sins against you, we think, well, they need to come to us. Uh, 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 uh. That's not what it says. When someone sins against you, you have to go to them. Just you and that brother. And then you talk to that person. And prayerfully, they see their sin. And you win them over. And your friends, your buddies, and you're in harmony. You're in harmony because of the truth has been restored. And love covers a multitude of sins. Are you with me right here, guys? You know, one of the challenges, I think, that as we build the church right here, are all of us coming from such a a diverse background. Uh, Officially, our congregation began May 6th, so this is just the end of the second month. But the Portland Mission team came down here about April 1st, and there are about 42 of us. And it's, it's been an extraordinary time, just how many people have been baptized, how many people have been restored and have been placing membership And it's been kind of interesting as as this many people have come together to take hold of the promised land, so to speak. And uh, it's it's very interesting to me that there's become just a a, kind of a little bit of a controversy that I want to address directly. What, What is the difference between restoration and placing membership? Well, it's very simple from a biblical point of view. You were restored if you fall away from God. Amen. Now, you can place membership as long as you agree to be a sold-out disciple. We believe the Bible teaches that every person that responds to Jesus Christ must respond to his grace, his dying on the cross, in the response of being a sold-out disciple by giving up everything. Amen? Amen. So anybody that's baptized in the congregation is called to the standard of God's word. Anybody that places membership is called to the standard of God's word. And anybody that's restored is called to the standard of God's word. Amen, guys? Now, here comes the tricky part. For a lot of us, we're doing well spiritually. We're dealing with the Canaanites pretty good. And so we see some brothers and sisters that are weaker. And we say, well, I I, I think, well, they they need to be restored. Now, there's no question they're not cranking. There's no question they need to be strengthened. But if someone's kept their connection with God, then as long as they repent of the sin in their life, We can help them with the weakness of their life, and they can become a sold-out disciple. Now, it's kind of interesting what's happened here. I'm going to kind of pick on a couple people here. Uh, First of all is uh, our our beloved daughter in the faith, Kathy Martinez. We love Louise and Kathy with all of our heart. And I was so thrilled when we got with them and said, hey, guys, you know, we're really trying to start something new, something where we can evangelize Los Angeles. From here, we can evangelize the world. 
And Luis goes, oh, man, that's what I want to be a part of. And he came a couple times. And he says, okay, I'm going I'm to place membership. Kathy goes, well, you know, I'm out of town with the Girl Scouts this weekend. I go, amen, sis. Go with the Girl Scouts. <laughs> so she says, I'll place membership next weekend. So she came, and she came up front, and she got up here, and she could hardly get a word out. She was so broken before the Lord. She'd gotten so weak that as she spoke, she says, you know, it's just great to come back to God. And so if you talk to Kathy, she'll say, oh, that Sunday was great when I got restored. (laughs) Even though she was placing membership, amen? Another couple that I love with all of my heart is Jack and Jeannie McGee. Our our own Caleb. And, uh, you know, Jack and Jeannie, they, they came clear across country. To be able to be a part of the congregation. In the midst of, of coming across country, they, they even dragged the son, Jared, who had never been baptized. He comes to church and says, man, I feel the spirit of God. And just a few weeks later, he gets baptized. Amen. Well, now, the amazing thing is after after they watched Jared become a sold out disciple, it's kind of interesting. Jack talked to, I believe it was Lance or Jeff and says, you know, I think uh, even though I placed membership about a month ago, I, I think I just need to go before the church and get restored. See, sometimes it takes a little time to get perspective of just how far you've gotten out there. But here's the bottom line. Restoration, place membership. Here's what this church is about. We're all about preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified. We're all about reaching out to anyone, whether they just be totally a person that doesn't believe in Jesus or whether they're a believer that just has never really found the truth or whether there's someone that's thought they had the truth. They've wandered away from the church, but they still connected to God. Whatever. This is a church with open arms that wants to bring anyone from anywhere on in. Amen. Now, it's not with a sense of compromise. It's not with a sense of tolerating sin or lukewarmness, but on the other hand, we'll take you just as you are <laughs> because you're stuck with us once you place membership. Amen, guys. <laughs> you know, it's it's I mean, guys, I, you know, I, I've been blessed to lead churches in, in Boston and L.A. and to have planted churches in Moscow and Bangkok. And the, the Lord has blessed Elena and myself. Incredible. What's been amazing is since we've come, and of course the church just officially started the beginning of May. Here it is two months later. Our church, in the time that the mission team has been here, has had 10 people baptized, 24 people restored, and 30 people placed membership. And a lot of the people placed in membership were weak, or were like Kathy Martinez and decided later she needed to be restored. <laughs> Guys, I, I've seen a lot of things. I've never seen anything like it. The only thing I can say is, it must be the Lord. It must be the Lord. And you know, if if we are going to build a church that glorifies God, where we have an intense love for our brother because we love the Lord, if we're going to build a church that becomes a center point to evangelize the world in this generation, then we cannot have a failure to communicate. If we have an uncomfortability with a brother or a sister, we've got to take it to them. And then in grace, we've got to listen to them on out. And then we've got to go to God and be united. Here's the bottom line, guys. It is great to be in the Lord. Amen. Amen. It is great to be able to study about our forefathers in the faith. But our challenge before us is now it's time to take Los Angeles for Jesus Christ. It's time to take California, the United States, and the world. And to God be the glory. Thank you, and God bless.